So thanks for coming along uh, tonight. Um, my name is David Sloan. I'm the principal agronomist with Aquaspy. And uh, I've also got Eric Betchett up the back here, who's uh, one of our um, technical guys, uh, lives in Hayes. Uh, I actually pick my accent. I'm not local. I, uh, I'm from Australia, which is where this technology began. And I've been working with it for the last 15 years. Um, I'm actually based in the US now, uh, living in St. Louis. But I've been working in uh, mainly in the Texas uh, High Plains, North Plains area since 2010. And we've been uh, selling a service direct to farmers uh, since 2010. But uh, going forward uh, uh, from this point on, we're working through dealers and uh, Garden City Co-op are going to be uh, selling and servicing this equipment. So what I want to do tonight is uh, talk to you about soil moisture monitoring and uh, what it is, what uh, you can do with it. But more importantly, how you make money out of soil moisture monitoring, out of this technology. As irrigators, what we do is pump water out of the ground and turn it into money. You put it through a crop and uh, uh, turn it into cash. And so the better that you can do that, the better your conversion rate of, of water into money, the higher your, the better your irrigation efficiency, obviously the more profitable, the more sustainable you're going to be. So I want to take you through on a little bit of a journey tonight. And I'm going to start way back with uh, Irrigation Agronomy 101. You know, why do we do what do we do? What is, and, and start from that point and move forward and actually finish up with the technology. And uh, um, I might actually ask Eric when he's uh, ready to grab me a probe and a telemetry unit out of the truck. We forgot to do that, but I, you've got a little bit of time. So let's get into it. Why do we... Oh, I'll turn this on. Why do we do what we do? When you irrigate, obviously you're putting water on the crop and you're increasing yield. And so we might get some yield with no water applied, a dry land situation. And then as you in, uh, add water, you'll get a higher yield up to a, a certain point where some crops will actually waterlog and you'll start to depress yield. Other crops will have a much flatter response. And so in the case of corn, or in case of cotton, you get a penalty for overwatering. In the case of corn, you can actually get a large, or uh, the same yield for a large range in, in water applied. You may have some wells that are um, uh, 600 gallon a minute, some wells that are 800 gallon a minute. They get the same, same yield at the end of the day. You run them for the same number of hours so that the high yielding well actually puts on more water and yet it doesn't give you any more yield. Why? Because they're up on that flat part of the curve. So the interesting thing is that what that allows us to do is actually back off the amount of water that we're using and actually not sacrifice any yield at all. And in fact, if we are strategic about how we irrigate, I'll show you how you can actually use less water and increase yield simply by, it's, it's all about the timing. It's not how much you've got, it's, it's how you use it, what you do with it. And so uh, it should also be noted that there is an economic optimum for uh, irrigation and that economic optimum is never the biological maximum. There's always, uh, it's the law of diminishing returns. Think of it a bit like gas mileage. You get the best gas mileage in your pickup truck, not doing 80 miles an hour, but usually doing around 60. And so it depends what it is that you're trying to achieve. If you want to set yield records, you're going to actually probably spend more money doing it. But if you're wanting to, uh, to be the most efficient, then you actually can afford to probably back off your irrigation leaves you room for rain will actually help you but um, it does put you on that that edge of that uh, that slope there so if you don't get enough then you know you could get adverse results but really we need to think about water in those terms and I'm not here to tell you to save water although that's a great thing usually people are going to take that water and just grow more crop which is that's a great thing because you can value add that and that's all about turning water into more money so I said it's all in the timing the value of every inch, well, I just showed you the uh, law of diminishing returns, that the value of uh, each inch of irrigation water decreases with increasing volume. So the, the very first uh, few inches you put on are actually going to have the biggest effect, and then as you get to the, the 30th inch, it's going to have less and less effect. But the, the, um, the timing is, is far more important. Crop water use changes during the season, so irrigation should match or mirror plant demand. Corn that's, that's six inches tall doesn't need the same amount of water that corn that's ten feet tall. 
And so you should remember that. And when we turn on the, um, the pivot and, and set it and let it run, you turn it on on day one and you turn it off three months later, it, it's a standard irrigation strategy for a lot of people, you're putting on the same amount of water every, every week. And yet the plant doesn't need it. We need to be a bit more strategic about how we irrigate and you'll get a better result. The value of uh, irrigation changes during the growing cycle. You give me an inch of water during tassel, it's going to be worth probably four or five times the amount an inch of water during the early part of the growing season or the late part of the growing season. So the timing of irrigation is, is super critical. And that becomes critical when you are looking at your water budget and how many acres you're going to grow of a certain crop at a certain time. So for split plantings and things like that, that's, that's a really critical factor. You want to provide the opportunity to catch rainfall. It'd be nice if you got more rain in this environment, so not such a big effect, but uh, certainly in other areas like uh, eastern Nebraska, if you're running with a full, full profile all the time, then uh, that's not going to help you either. But um, yeah, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, water is money. Let's maximise that conversion rate. And in order to do that, you need to evaluate every, ir evaluate every irrigation. So let's check up what you do. Every time that pivot walks over that probe, let's have a look and see, did it, how did I go? Did I get fill the, uh, the profile? Did I get it too deep? Uh, how am I going? So what I want you to focus on is being strategic. Well, what I'd like to teach you, I guess, is, is strategic irrigation management. And so strategic irrigation management is really a, what I said earlier, matching irrigation with plant water requirements. So it's all about understanding what water does to a plant and trying to set that plant up for success. How so? By promoting a bigger root system. You get a bigger root system on that plant and you can encourage that through irrigation, you will have a better result. And so uh, we need to understand what's going on in that active root zone. We need to measure it, we need to know how big it is and we need to try and manipulate it and make it bigger if we can. We need to watch where the water is going. How fast am I running my pivot? Quite often, around this environment, people are running too fast. They need to slow down. When you slow down, you get water deeper, and you'd be surprised, uh, especially in the last uh, few years where it's been really dry, hot and windy, how, just how shallow those irrigations are going in. And it's not until you actually watch what's going on that you realise, man, I, I never thought that was the case. But uh, conversely, you get a wet winter, like 2010, Water can go straight through the profile. You fire up on, uh, you know, at early in the season because it's the time to irrigate, and uh, you may be putting water straight out the bottom and you didn't know it. So we need to match or manage that uh, irrigation and drainage. We need to watch where the fertilizer goes. So you're running fertilizer through your pivot, or if you're dry applied, or even uh, anhydrous, you still, if you're pushing water out the bottom, you're pushing fertilizer out as well. And it's uh, it's not just the cost of fertilizer which is costs a lot, it's the opportunity cost of what you're missing out on putting it through the crop. And that's what's going to make you your money. Uh, managing production risk. You know, we can make it rain, so you can actually, if you know what that strategy should be, if you know where you should be and the season's trying to drag you off, you can actually get back on target again. And to do that, we use an irrigation template. So that's all about process control. And so I'll show you about uh, um, how we use this tool for, for process control. Irrigation Agronomy 101. So what does water do to a plant? So we're growing a plant, it's made up of a bunch of cells. Think of those cells like bricks in a wall. And we can have, uh, to make a bigger wall, you can have more bricks, or you can have bigger bricks, or if you can create more bricks and they're larger, then you're going to grow that wall more quickly. And so We've got two processes that are going on here, it's photosynthesis or, or cell production, and we've got cell expansion or how big they are. And so those two processes are affected in different ways by soil moisture content. Along the bottom, this is dry, this is wet, so we've got a full point and a refill point and that can move. But really when the soil is full and water is non-limiting, but we haven't waterlogged the crop, We'll, we'll maximise both growth and cell expansion. So let's uh, make this real for you. If, uh, if I'm growing grass and I, I have it well watered and uh, well drained so it's not uh, waterlogged, and so 
I've just renovated my front lawn and I put in an irrigation system and I fertilize it and I have the sprinkler come on every morning, 5 a.m., 5 or 10 minutes, and just keep that, that grass well watered. In summertime around here, I'm going to be mowing it every four days. Why? Because what I'm doing is I'm keeping that water content, that soil moisture, way up here where I'm maximizing not only growth but also cell expansion. So I'm producing leaves, but I'm making the leaves really long. If I don't want to mow it every four days, I can be in control of that. I can let the grass or the, the soil moisture condition drop down a little bit and operate in a zone where cell expansion isn't maximized. Photosynthesis is, growth is, I'm still making it lush and green and I'm producing all the leaves, but they're just not as long. It's sort of like a bonsai grass plant. But it's, it's, what we're doing is we're using irrigation to control the outcome. And that's the really important, important thing here, is that irrigation does control what's going on in a plant and you can, there is a lot of science in it. So you can actually manipulate where you operate on this curve to drive an outcome. And so in some situations, for example in uh, grapevines, uh, wine grape production, the, the vine will produce three times more leaf than you need to create the sugars to fill the berries. You don't need all that leaf. And by growing it, the, all the, the vignerons do is, is come through and, and hedge the vines. They want to let the, uh, the light and the air in there so they don't get disease. And so they're growing it and cutting it off. Why do that? That's a waste. So they actually use stress. They, they come back down here and actually slow the growth, slow the cell expansion, get a smaller canopy because you don't need all that. So they're, they're using irrigation management strategically. And then later on, they'll, they'll move it up because different things are going on in the plant. Same thing happens in corn. In corn, you, uh, when that corn is uh, tasseling and silking, you're producing pollen, you're producing silks, all this is going on inside the plant. If you don't maximize cell expansion, then you're not going to push those silks out of the ear and you're not going to pollinate as well. So if you don't keep the moisture up near the full point here, then it could hurt you. So you have to understand what the plant needs and give it that and you'll be successful. Or if you can, you can control the moisture to drive the crop in a certain direction. And really, strategic irrigation management is both. So uh, what we can do is actually come up with a, a target zone. And this target zone actually changes as you go through the, the life cycle of the crop too. So here we're saying this is really wide. Why? Because this happens to be furrow irrigation and I'm only irrigating every 12 days. And when I irrigate every 12 days, the soil dries out. So we're actually going to drop down this curve only because we have to. Whereas if I'm drip irrigating and I can irrigate every single day, I can keep it wherever I want on this curve because it moves only a very small amount. It dries out a small amount, fill it up a small amount, and I get really, really good control. So I can actually move where I sit on that curve. If I'm um, irrigating every five or six days with a pivot, then I may dry that down and wet it up and dry it down and wet it up but I, I can still try and shift where I am on that curve. And so we can take that green zone and make it narrower or, or wider. We can move it up or move it down and be strategic about it. And that's really important when I get on to talking about templates. So how, does, how do we use the, uh, the moisture probes to, where, where do they fit into this whole thing? Well, what we've got with the, um, the probe is we put it in the field and it's connected to a logger and that logger takes a reading, actually takes a reading every three minutes, but we're logging readings every 15 minutes. So we get 96 readings a day. It's a continuous trace of what's going on in the soil. And that is really important because what it does is it maps out, here the, we've irrigated, but this stair-stepping is really, really important because during the day the plant drinks and overnight it doesn't and during the day it drinks and overnight it doesn't. So we can actually watch the plant drinking. I don't need to know how full or, or empty the soil is. All I need to do is know how to listen to it and understand what it's telling me. And so it's actually telling me that I'm starting off quite small here and then I'm getting bigger and then I'm getting smaller again. Why? Because that plant actually, this is, in this situation it's cotton and it's row watered and it doesn't like it too wet loves it just in the, the middle here, and then it doesn't like it when it gets dry. The crop's telling me that. I don't have to work it out. I just have to watch and listen. 
And so it's actually giving me the zone of moisture that it's happiest working in. And I can let the crop be the guide if I only know how to listen to it. And so that's really the paradigm shift. So everyone's used to checkbook methods and, and things like that when it comes to irrigation scheduling and saying, well, the soil holds this much and I've got an allowable deficit. That's great, and I'm not saying don't listen to that. Do that as well. But I can now cross-check it with what the crop's telling me. Because the experience in Australia, um, where I'm from, these guys were, and with exactly this data, and we're going back, this is 04, but it happened earlier than that, uh, they were growing cotton with um, measuring soil moisture with a neutron probe. It's a manual device. Uh, it happens to be radioactive, so it's... it's oh and uh, regulations come along with it. But basically you go along and you take readings. I used to go every third day and uh, they'd, they'd take this device out there, they'd lower it down um, an open pipe and take, take readings at different depths in the soil and move on to the next site. And so because it was manual, no one ever went out there straight after an <coughs> irrigation. A, you just irrigated, you didn't need to make a decision. But B, it's heavy clay soil and you're slopping around in mud up to your ankles and what you didn't want to do is mess up that site. So nobody ever got this information. They all started at about this point once the soil had dried out. And then they started to get a few readings and they got very, very good at saying, hey, I know when my crop is, uh, needs an irrigation because I'm slowing it down. I better get my water on. And so they got very good at irrigating as soon as they got to this inflection point and, and went again. And they then got allowable deficits and they said, okay, when I get to dry the soil out this much, away we go but they were missing the biggest, uh, um, uh, biggest hurt, the biggest stress out there was actually waterlogging. They knew the crop went a little bit yellow, that's all right, it'll grow out of it, but it was costing them money. As soon as they put probes out there, what they could do is listen to the crop. And what the crop told them was, well, even though I'm now midday, I'm, I'm stressing during the day and I'm looking a bit, bit wilted and going blue, I'm still actually growing these stair steps down here are still bigger than the stair steps up there. The slope of this line is still greater than the slope of that line. And very quickly they went, ah, so if I'm just going to keep going here until these stair steps get the same or less than those stair steps, then I'm, I'm actually, that's a good thing. So the crop was tougher than I gave it credit for. They stretched the, the, the cycle out by two days every, every irrigation. And suddenly, after seven irrigations, they'd picked up 14 days. They'd, they'd cut out a whole irrigation, saved themselves four inches. But the biggest thing was, the roots now, the plant got a bit thirsty. It's put its roots deeper and got into an area that didn't waterlog. And then the plant started growing through the waterlogging. And guess what? They got less of this, and they went from a three bale average to a four bale average across the industry just by changing what they did. Saved an irrigation and got 30% more yield simply by watching and listening. And I'm not saying that the same thing will happen here, except that down in Texas, the guys, they're changing their irrigation practices big time by watching what the crop does. And they're moving to drippers, they're um, uh, slowing down their pivots, they're doing a lot of things, and they're growing really good corn on four and a half gallons per acre per minute. So they're watching and learning. I, before I go on here, and Eric, I might get you to bring that up. Anyone got any questions so far? No? Okay. So now that we've introduced how the technology can be used to listen to the crop, let's actually introduce the technology. And um, what we've got, thank you, is a probe. I'll come back over this side. And this probe, it's actually got a cover on here, so the probe actually stops there. And so you can see uh, basically where that cable comes out is, is the top picture over here. But this probe is a four foot probe and it's got a sensor every four inches down here. Okay, so we've got 12 sensors and every sensor is measuring soil moisture, temperature and electrical con conductivity. Okay, and EC is important because uh, EC changes, the con soil conductivity changes with the amount of moisture but also with the amount of salts and ions in there. And so the thing that changes uh, the salts and ion content is fertilizer. And so we're already measuring moisture, we strip that out, what we're left with is really the ability to track fertilizer and fertigation. So that's uh, very important, but that's the probe. We uh, have a cable 
The reason we've got this cap on here is because we've got a little junction under there to an extension cable, just in case the extension cable gets nibbled on by something and we can come and change it over. Uh, it goes to a telemetry unit. The telemetry unit is cellular and it's solar powered. And so what this is fully self-contained, it's got a logger in here. And so it, it's connected to the probe. So this will sit in your field out here. And uh, it, it logs away all summer. Generally, we will put the probe in after you've got a plant stand. So after the crop's emerged, put the probe in, put the telemetry out there and it sits there for the life of the crop. And then prior to harvest, come and take it all away again. Okay. And uh, there are situations where we're putting them in permanently. So we're actually, with this um, not having this flat cap, but burying the probe below the uh, tilled layer. So if you strip tilling, the first sensor, we may miss the first foot, but we'll get the second, third, fourth, and fifth foot. And we can leave it in there uh, all like permanently. We trench the cable, we have a long cable run, put the telemetry on the outside of the field, and bury the cable 20 inches down. So we can do that as well. And um, it's actually working pretty well in this environment. So um, yeah, cellular, we're working on uh, Verizon uh, or AT&T or other, other versions of GSM out here. Some people have got Viero up in, over in Colorado, uh, but it's, it's cellular. So wherever we've got um, a cellular data signal, we can bring this back. Uh, so that's um, the, the hardware. So let's talk about strategic irrigation management. So what we've got uh, is, I talk about matching irrigation with, uh, with plant water requirements. So let's understand the plant requirements. Start off with the plant and say, okay, how do I irrigate for best, uh, best yield? So corn is the obvious choice here, although I'll, I'll talk about sorghum as well. And what we've got with this corn water use curve, it's stylized because what it, this is out of a textbook. It's showing the stages of growth across here versus stress at different, or the um, percent yield reduction if you get stress at different growth stages. So what this is saying is if I get stress during this, uh, um, basically the pollination stage, I'm up at 40 to 50 percent yield reduction. And in the last uh, few years, 2011, it proved that point. A lot of people came up with uh, half of what they would normally expect if they didn't silage their crops, certainly down in Texas they did, um, because they, they had stress at that critical time. So what does that tell you? Rule number one, don't let it stress at that time. So that's easier said than done because very few people have the ability to supply water to match what the crop needs at that time. So, and I'd suggest if you did have enough water to, to keep up with it, then you're probably wasting water. You can actually, uh, you can use stored soil moisture to your advantage. But what's going to happen for some period in that crop's life is that it will be at, in deficit. So what that means is you can't keep up with your irrigation. You're running behind. What does that mean? It means the crop's got to get its water from somewhere or you're going to end up with a yield loss. So where is it going to get it from? Out of the sky? Or out of the soil. Well, this year we got it out of the sky, which was pretty lucky, but the only thing you can rely on is getting it out of the soil. And so the only, it means you, there's two things that you need to get water out of the soil. You need water in the soil, and you need a root system to extract it. And so we need to manage the root zone. And guess what? We've got a tool that can measure the root zone. And so that's where all this really uh, becomes very powerful. Once you know where your roots are, and you know where the water is, then you can bring it all together. So to start off with, oh sorry, if um, the ability to supply water uh, will determine how much of a deficit you go into. So for example, in 2011, people, um, I mean, the, it was hot, it was windy, and the irrigation efficiency went down. So while you were pumping the same amount of water, you just got less, uh, it was a tough year. Why? Because the environment took it all. It just blew away. And so you went into deficit earlier, it lasted longer, it was deeper and you stressed at that uh, during the critical stage and the yield suffered. So what a lot of people have done in response to that is tried water saving features. I mentioned, uh, I mean, just slowing your pivot down, but bubblers and, and other things or just cutting back on your acre, acres and trying to get it back up to five, six, seven gallons per acre per minute. 
and just get your, your acreage in balance. So um, whatever your method, you need to understand how much water you've got and how much deficit you're going to go into, but you'll probably still go into deficit. So coming back to using that stored soil moisture, what we need to do is put water in the soil uh, when you have the opportunity to, and that's early in the season when your ability to supply water is greater than the actual crop need. You can, uh, you can put water in there. Or before you plant the crop, you can pre-irrigate. So we've got both those, uh, those opportunities. The thing is, most people will, will go pretty heavy early on trying to bank that moisture. You wait and wait and wait and see what rainfall comes. Rainfall didn't come. Plant the crop, get it up. Then I'm going to start trying to, to fill the profile. And that's great. I mean, we, we need to do it. Because if you don't have the pro profile full before this crop overtakes you, you're going to be behind. The strategic thing is that how do you do this? And what is a very common practice is a four and a half day loop. I'll put on an inch, whatever it I can get on there in, in four and a half days. And so every four and a half days that crop's used to getting a drink. And just like that cotton scenario in Australia, about that time as the crop you know, gets its uh, inch and it's using it. and then it's just thinking, oh, well, I've used what I've got access to. I need to go and put my roots down. But guess what? Pivot comes over and I don't need to do that. So then I, I don't grow my roots sort of very deep. And then the pivot comes around again, just as it's thinking about putting its roots down. And so by running fast, you're actually uh, encouraging a shallow root system. If you slow it down, that plant actually gets a little bit thirsty, it's got to have moisture there. The roots don't grow into dry soil. They, they will chase the moisture. But they will chase it. You're going slower, so you're putting more on. Fills it back up, and then you can go again. And just simply by slowing, giving it another couple of days, it makes a huge difference in the, uh, the depth of the roots. And so, um, once again, we've got the, the tool to show you how deep those roots are and to show you how deep that water is penetrating. If you get it wrong, what are you doing? If you if you run too fast here, yeah, you might get water in the soil, but you may not have the roots to match because you've inadvertently created a shallow root system. That shallow root system might rob you of water at the time that you need that's going to help you the most. And so if you, if you don't, I mean, yes, you've got lots of water here, but if you can't get it out, then that's, uh, you might run into stress anyway. And so this is what I'm talking about with strategic irrigation management. I'm not talking about running the well any less. I'm just talking about trying to change the way, the timing that you use it. And uh, it will, it, experience has shown that you'll get a really good result from that. So we're trying to bend the line in our favour. And if I'm running slow at the start, chances are by the time I get to, to tassel, I've actually put on one less irrigation anyway. I mean, I'm, I may, I may not, but experience has, has shown that, you know, you may, you run slow, you actually fill the profile up and I can stop, I can park it for a day or a couple of days and then I the crop grows a bit, bit more, I might get to park it for a day and then I'm just, I'm off and running. But uh, you may get to save some water early on in the season uh, and you, uh, you, by having a large root system, what we're trying to do is cheat here and get more out of the soil. So instead of in that peak time having a, a 30 inch root system, I want a 48 inch root system. I can get access to another inch, inch and a half of moisture when I need it to make my crop because if I stress, it's going to hurt me. And uh, then at the back end here, if I've got a big root system, chances are, and, and I know that I can extract all that moisture because I can see it being used, I'm, I'm going to have a much better chance of saving another turn at the back end and getting it out of the soil and not, not having to put it on and pay for it and have it come off my allocation and all that. So. Experience has shown that generally we can cut out an irrigation at the front end, usually cut out an irrigation at the back end and still improve your yield. And uh, so you can have your cake and eat it too. Depends where you're starting, depends on the season. But that's the, the broad experience that we've been able to achieve. So what does that look like? Well, I've got this, uh, I showed you that, that curve before from cotton. Well, this is a whole season of corn and it uh, happens to be from Texas, but we can still see the, the, the stair-stepping uh, going on in there. And really what this green band is, is, is saying that's, this whole thing here is an irrigation template. 
And so we can see how full the soil should be. And then what we're saying early on, we can let the soil dry down a little bit. That's okay because we're trying to encourage a root system. <coughs> then we want to fill it up and we want to try and move that whole, if you think back to those curves with photosynthesis, photosynthesis and uh, cell expansion, we want to move it back during that, that peak time, if we can, move it closer to the wet end so that we're actually helping uh, cell expansion with uh, what pollination, you know, uh, silking, blister, all of that good stuff that's going on inside the plant. We're trying to, to raise this closer to the wet end and then at the back we can start to dry it down towards the end and try and not overwater at the beginning and the end. So it's always hard to get this in the first season, but it's very easy to get that bang on in the first season. Very easy. If I talk about sorghum, uh, different crops have different templates. And so you need to understand when you talk about strategic irrigation management, what's the strategy for this crop? Where's the hurt? So this is some work that was done down at Edder in Texas, so just south of Stratford, so not too far away. Uh, similar environment for sure. Now what this is, is they've watered at each of these stages down the bottom here and called that 100% of yield, okay? And then they've got different strategies where they didn't water and so here they just watered it up and then let it go. Basically it's a dry land crop and they got 18% of what was a fully irrigated crop. So what got the best? What was the, the next best strategy if I was going to miss an irrigation? And it happened to be, I get 93% or almost 94% of 100 when they miss the final irrigation. Why is that? You've got to think about sorghum production and what sorghum does is that that panicle, all the seeds are actually set very early on in the crop cycle. So it's sort of 30 to 45 days after uh, emergence, uh, actually after, um, yeah, after emergence. That crop is, is pretty much trying to forecast what's, what's my season looking like and if it looks good, I'm going to have a lot of tillers and I'm going to have a lot of large panicles and I'm setting a lot of grain. Then the next thing you have to do is pollinate that grain. Once that grain's pollinated, that crop will fight tooth and nail to fill those grains. And it's not, they're not big grains, so it's going to really extract every ounce of moisture it can to put into that grain. Whereas what, what came up the, uh, the least at 46, like less than half, is where the early irrigations were missed. Why? Because that crop is looking ahead and it's going, man, I'm running out of moisture. I'm going to be conservative. I've got to still set grain that's viable, but I don't want to run out. So I'm just not going to tiller as much. I'm not going to set as big a panicles. I'm not going to set as much grain. You've done your yield right there. Because it doesn't matter how much, if you pollinate 100%, if you fill it as, as big as it can be, you just don't have as much grain. And so you've got to think about when, when you're growing this crop and you're irrigating, where is, how am I going to be strategic about this? And so take home message here is with sorghum, don't short it early on. It may be fine with stored soil moisture if you've got a lot of it. Um, but you know, you don't want to miss the neck here and, and short yourself on yield. And so what are the template, like corn sort of went down and came back up and then went down. With sorghum, what we're trying to do is keep it running wet and then at the back end dry it down. It just looks different. I don't need to go into the ins and outs of <coughs> corn versus uh, sorghum irrigation other than just understand that we have different templates for different crops and they look like they do for a reason. And so we've got, as an um, aquaspy, uh, what we can do, bring to you is a lot of experience with, with uh, all of the mainstream crops and provide these templates uh, as a guide, which is a starting point, and then you'll craft them from there and, and personalise them. So let's get into the nitty gritty of the data and how we use it to, uh, to be successful. And I'm going to teach you five things here. And uh, so first off is, is all about the depth of the root zone. We want to know where our roots are and we want to encourage uh, deeper roots. But knowing where your roots are is, is critical. We want to look at where the water is going. We want to make sure that it's getting deep enough but not going so deep that it drains away. We want to make sure that we uh, put fertilizer on correctly. Uh, that you're getting best, you know, holding it in that root zone. Um, we want to look at the, uh, the seasonal templates, which are process control. And so I just looked at two different ones there. And uh, so we show you how the software um, 
makes it easy for you. And then also the final irrigation, what we're doing uh, with that. So as you go through, um, well, I'll, I'll give you examples. I'll also give you some case study examples too. So the depth of the root zone, what is this trace all about? Well, remember we've got this probe that's got these 12 sensors all the way down the probe. Well, now we've got 12 colored lines down here that marry up to each sensor, okay? And each colored line, you sort of have to read it individually, but what we've got, we've got the pink line is four inches, the blue line is eight and 12 and 16 and 20 and 24 and so on and so forth. So we can actually see the different layers mapped out. And what's really neat is we're looking for those stair steps. Why? Because the plant uses water during the day and not at night and showing active water use at those different layers. So it's really, really obvious. We can actually start to look and see you know, where it's stair-stepping at the purple, and then it just starts at the, uh, the, the um, orange here, so we're at 16 and 20, but not at 24. Then 24 starts to go, then 28 starts to go, then 32 starts to go. We can watch the plant putting its roots down. It's really neat, and, it's, uh, and so we know how deep the roots are, and we can try and push them in a certain direction and so you get immediate feedback and so you can you basically you're in touch with what that crop is uh, is up to and it's um you know deeper roots mean deeper or better access to uh, moisture at, at key times and we can also when it comes to the final irrigation we know that we're making that decision on the root system that you've grown throughout the season not guessing and i'll give you a good example of that one uh, better roots means better, you know, less lodging at the uh, back end there, so better harvestability. But uh, the, um, this, I don't know whether you can see it up the back here, better roots equals improved yield. I mean, it, it, it's true. So then it comes to putting the water on. How fast do I run my pivot? I want to get the water deep enough, but I don't want to get it so deep that it runs through. So what do I do? How, uh, you know, what's the speed? Well. If we zoom in and we look, this happens to be data from over one, two, three, those irrigations there, or oh, it's actually rainfall. Uh, what we're looking, when moisture comes on, the sensors kick up. But in this situation, the pink and the blue have kicked up, but the green hasn't. So four and eight have gone up, but, but 12 inches hasn't. I know that that little bit of rainfall has gone in at four and eight, but it didn't make it to 12 inches. Then we had another shower that came on and it went down to 24, but it didn't make it to 28. And we've stepped that pink line up and we've stepped the blue line up so we've actually got it wetter at those levels then we've had some more rain and it's uh, gone down to 24 but not to 28 and they've come up again so I can just watch that top two feet wetting up and I know exactly where the water has gone I'm not guessing I can see and so uh, it's it's really neat to say hey the pivots just walked over my probe how effective was I and you might be surprised when it only goes down 16 inches and you thought, man, is that all? Or it's not a lot of cases, only 8 to 12. And people think, can't be right. Go out and dig a hole. Sure enough, water is, uh, is not going as deep as, anywhere deep, near as deep as what they thought. Then you get to, um, over to this side where we see a blip. And that blip is really, what's happening is as the water moves through, it blips up. So here they came up, but they stayed high. Why? Because moisture has been caught at that level. But if it goes up and it comes back to the same point, what's happened is water has moved down through the, the soil and hasn't been caught. So as it goes past the sensor, the sensor blips up and then it comes back to where it was because the moisture level hasn't changed. It hasn't caught any more moisture. And so that little blip is a drainage signature. And so I can watch water passing through or I can watch water being caught. And between the two things, I can actually say, Okay, didn't go deep enough, slow my pivot down. Now I can see it going deeper. Uh, maybe I'll slow it down again. Whoop, gone too deep. I can speed up and I can very quickly get a feel for how fast I need to run. And water moves through wet soil. So here's the thing, it's very important when it comes to fertigation. But uh, water sticks to the, the surface of the soil particles. And so it coats the soil particles. And the finer the soil, the more surface area I've got. I've got lots and lots and lots of particles with silt. And so there's more surface area for water to stick to. So silt loams hold more water than a sand. A sand is much coarser, doesn't have as much surface area, it can't hold as much water. Some water does sit in the pore spaces, but it actually coats 
the, uh, the particle, that's what it sticks to, which really makes you think it's in the pore spaces. So once I've coated all this, the, the surface area, I've got, no more, I've got nothing else for the water to stick to and it, it drains through. So what does all that mean? I'll give you a real life example, and you could do this experiment at home, but go and get a potted plant. And I actually did this with my son and videoed it as a science experiment. We, um, we wet up a, a pot, we actually did it with sponges, but if you get a pot and you wet it up, and until it drains and then you just leave it and let it equilibrate so come back an hour or two later you get, a, get some more water but this time put dye in it put some red dye or blue dye in it pour it on that pot it's going to drain immediately but what comes out is colored water it's the, it's, it's the red water or the blue water it, it's <coughs> like so if that was fertigation or it had fertilizer in it it's just gone straight through because there's nothing for it to stick to so you need to, and conversely, if you've got dry soil and you fertigate and you can see it coming in and wetting up, that's going to be stuck in that root zone. That's exactly what you want. You want it there available to that plant. So uh, by measuring and watching what's going on in the root zone, knowing how big the root zone is and what the root zone dynamics are, you can actually be really, really effective at fertigation. So we come into fertigation, so we want to know how deep the roots are. Uh, so you can place the fertilizer in the root zone. You want to know how deep that water is going. So if you're putting water in the fertilizer and you watch where the fertilizer is, uh, where the water is going, then if by definition you're watching where the fertilizer is going. But, but what's also really neat is the EC data. And so we've got this other, it's still new for us. We've only gone through a season um, with it. And so we are still learning how to use it really effectively. And what I mean by that is we're seeing a lot of changes, but the thing that affects conductivity the most is moisture. And at the moment, we're measuring conductivity with moisture and changes in fertilizer. We're also measuring moisture, and so we're still working out how to strip the moisture out with the calibration, which we hope to have uh, pretty well dialed in coming into this, this next season. But uh, right now, I'll give you an example of where we get some major changes due to saline irrigation water. And if I click on here, it'll take me to an example, which was over at Turpin, Oklahoma. So we're just south of Liberal, not too far away from here. And what we've got is this black line, and that's the soil moisture. And we're going along, and he's irrigating, and then it got hot, and he was deficit irrigating. The, the plant water use is picked up. Then it cooled down, and he was able to keep up with it. Then it, uh, I think he um, was able to increase the, the plant slowed down a little bit it was still cool able to catch up a little bit and he got some rain in here and then he was uh, just running to the end with his irrigation this other line here is the EC and we can see steadily the EC built up but then it went down and then it built up again well it built up because there was salt in the irrigation water but it went down because he had rainfall that leached it okay now that's, that's all nice to look at on, on this view as a, the whole profile. But what's really neat is when you look at it where the salt's gone in the, the um, profile. And so this is the, the soil moisture. And so I've got once again this what we call the sensor graph. And I can see up here my roots are going down. And what I'll just also show you too, roots started going down here. That crop started pulling moisture. As soon as he's irrigated, the root systems have stopped. And as soon as, like later on here, it's been looking, it, it, uh, um, things got, got warm and the roots have started going down again, you can see how dynamic that root growth is and how it responds to irrigation. And so if the plant needs to find moisture da deeper down, it'll go looking, put it on higher up. It uh, says, I don't need to go looking, I'll take it from, uh, from where I can. But uh, that's a side point. What we're looking at here is irrigation so these all step up and step up and step up and we can see it all the way down through the profile where we're wetting the soil all the way through moisture goes up you look at the EC conductivity straight away with the rainfall goes down rains again goes down rains again goes down same thing happens with the pink line same thing happens all the way we've got the uh, the light blue line in there is 24 inches we get to 28 inches which is the red and we can certainly see it in here with the green line uh, which is 32, and this yellow line, which is 36, they go up. 
So what's happened? The top has gone down, bottom's gone up. We've pushed, the rain has pushed the salt out of the top two feet and it's accumulating down there in the third foot. We can watch that happen. And so it, I can see it very obviously here because it's, it's salt and that really changes the EC. We're trying to get that same thing happening with, the, uh, with much more subtle changes with fertilizer. So the next thing, let's uh, look at uh, irrigation templates. So irrigation templates, I've said, are, are a recipe uh, uh, for success. They are they're process control. And so we've got a, a line here, which is how much water the soil can hold. And we've got a red line here, which is your refill point, And this green band, which is an optimum band. And so all of that's set in behind. And we will give you a template to get you going. Um, probably have to tweak that a little bit in the first year and then going into the second year you'll be, you'll be able to take what you did uh, from year one and roll it forward. But what's really nice about this is that we've got these simple icons. So if my current moisture is above this blue, blue line, I'm going to get an icon that's blue. If my, my uh, moisture is between that blue line and the bottom of this green zone, my icon will be green. If I'm below the bottom of the green but above the, uh, the refill, my icon will be yellow. And if I'm below the refill, it's red. And so what we're doing is we're taking all this complex information, which sort of happens underneath, and if you've got a consultant, then they, they can be looking at that really, really rich picture. As you start to learn and develop, you'll get, get very used to reading these graphs. But in the first instance, you don't have to. You can just look at, at quite simply, the colored icons. And so what we do is we put those on a map, which I'll show you, so you can see very quickly, or in a list, what's my snapshot of where I am. You see it on your phone, see it on your tablet. So really, but where we are is we have a season-long view that you'll, you'll look at, and then you can watch yourself. Basically, this line just fills in as you go, and you can start to see, well, let's just try and keep it in the green, and, and everything will be good, bearing in mind that we're going to try and set that, that green zone up uh, based on, on your situation. And uh, it will start off with some pretty generic uh, templates and then get better as we, we get more data. To give you an example of uh, real how templates can really keep you on track and you can make decisions. Uh, so this process control, if something's trying to drag me outside the, you know, off target, I can get back on target again. Um, in real time before it becomes a wreck. 2011, which was a wreck. Uh, we've got this guy, this is old software, so it looks different. But this farmer, he uh, is down at Hugerton, and so he's north of Hugerton, uh, so not too far away, had um, pretty good moisture, uh, pretty good irrigation capacity. So uh, I think he was 800 and something gallons a minute on his well and he heard me talk at the end of 2010 and that was a wet year and we're looking at drainage and he said, man, I'm on sandy ground, I've got big water, I've got a drainage problem. I need a probe, I want to see how bad it is, I'm washing fertilizer away. Put a probe in in 2011 and he didn't have a drainage problem, he had an infiltration problem. What was going on was he started going backwards, deficit irrigating really fast. Why? Because he was running his pivot too fast. So he knew that the template should do that. We didn't have that, that nice pretty green band that did it, and we do now. But he knew that he should be going this way, and he's going that way. So what am I going to do to change it? And we had a chat, and I said, slow down. So he went from a three-day, one, two, three steps, one, two, three steps, three-day circle to a five-day circle. And you can count them, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and he slowed down. And so he's putting on a whole lot more water, and guess what? More water's going in the soil. He started going in that direction, except over time, the, the water use is picking up. He's coming into tassel, and so he's still going backwards because it was 2011 and it was hot and dry. Um, but he turned what would have been an absolute wreck into something that was salvageable. Uh, he increased his irrigation there, and so he, he ended up with just a touch under 200 bushels, where everything else around him went 140, and he normally grows 250. So he hurt but it didn't hurt nearly as bad as he, if he hadn't made that change. It kept him in the game. And so it was just real-time feedback based on a template to keep you in, uh, basically on the rails. 
And if we have a look at the separate layer graph, we can see he had an infiltration problem. This green line here is four inches. This blue line here is eight inches. But guess what? That's not moving and he's irrigating. And so he's running around really fast and just evaporating all his water off his, his crop. So he slowed down and now water is really going in at four inches and now it's going in at eight inches and now it's getting down to 12 inches. Still not making it to 16, but he's doing a whole lot better. He's got more water in. And then he irrigated again in here. Still, uh, and then he, he got a rainfall. Yeah, I think he got uh, six or seven tenths. And suddenly that pushed it down to 16. Then the pivot came back over and he's now off and running and he kept it moist for the rest of the season. And uh, so that's how he got out of that, got out of that wreck. So yeah, process or templates are, are process control and it's, it's basically a way of, of knowing that if, as long as I keep on track and no matter what the season is trying to do and drag me off track, then, uh, then I'll be okay. Final irrigation. So we've got this, uh, this probe out there, this tool to know how much, how big my root system is and to know how much water is in that root system. So now I can, I, I'm dialed in. I can make a really accurate call on when to turn that pivot off. And so it's a bit like a car race. I don't want to finish the, go to over the finish line with a full tank of gas because it's a waste. You know, why, why put any more gas in there than I need to? But I want to make sure I get over that finish line. And so what you, you do is you, you know how big the gas tank is, you know how far you can drive the soil down, and you can also know where the finish line is because I know when I'm going to get to dent or I've got to dent, I can make a decision on, you know, I, I can forecast out when I'm going to get to black layer because I, I know how many day degrees it's going to take to get there. So I can pretty accurately forecast that. I then need to allow myself another 10 to 14 days after black layer because the crop will still use water after that time. It will still stair step down. And so I don't want to short it uh, too quickly. So I can put an X out here, basically as dry as I got the soil last time and based on the date that I need to finish out that crop, and so I don't want to finish up here full. I want to finish down here empty, but I want to make sure I'm north of that, that X. So, you know, as long as I, I get through in this sort of zone in here, I'm good. So I've got it all mapped out. So what I've got to do is just try and watch my, my, um, uh, the usage and forecast, you know, if I need to go again, I'll irrigate and give myself enough to run to the finish line. And where people have got it wrong is they didn't know how big, how deep their root system was. But I'll give you two examples here. And first one is uh, a farmer in, uh, he's down at Dalhart in Texas. And uh, he's light water, sandy soils, but um, he had two circles. One was a full circle, which is this one. And the other one, he didn't have enough water to do the full circle, so he grew half a circle. And the difference, he made two different decisions. So what we're seeing here is that he started his deficit irrigating all the way through the season until the crop water use started to level out with his ability to supply water. So it's, it's dropped down now to so many inches per day and he can keep up with that. But um, pretty much uh, the decision was, if you, you're running on empty and if you stop, that crop within you know, five days is gonna run out of water and so you can't, you gotta irrigate all the way to the finish line. And so just keep, keep going all the way to the end. And he shut down, you can see sort of step, 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 and then it's like an ECG. <laughs> Heartbeat's getting less and less, and then it stops. Uh, whereas on his other circle, we can actually see that these little blip, blip, and then blip, blip, the pivot has come around over the probe, hit the stop, come back over the probe, so we can actually see that double, double whammy, uh, and it, it wets up, and then it wets up again. Uh, but right at the end here, as that crop's slowing down, he hasn't slowed down the amount of water he's putting on. So he's getting ahead of that crop. He's putting more on than what that crop is, is needing. So he's going, he's getting the soil wetter and wetter. And so the decision there was, oh, you can stop. And we could have probably even saved an irrigation there um, or put a lighter one on, let it come down here and maybe jagged one a bit further down. But same farmer, two different circles, two different decisions, but they were the right decision. He was really happy with, uh, with what we, decided to do there. Different uh, scenario, uh, this was a trial, uh, it was actually run by the um, Texas AgriLife, their extension service. Farmer practice versus e extension service, trying to recommend what to do. Gone through the season, hadn't made any calls because everyone got busy and it was one of those years that uh, was it 2011. 
And we were having a field day out there, and so it was really hadn't made any, any, any call that was any different. But we looked at that and said, we were pretty much on this day here, and um, said, well, you're full, but are you going to irrigate again? He said, yeah, I'm going to put on one, one last pass. And we said, okay, here's the, here's the thing. We're not going to put on that last pass on the managed practice. And so farmer put this one on. The, uh, the managed practice didn't, missed it out. And really, you can see that they used pretty much the same amount of moisture uh, that crop did, but one was starting well above the, uh, the odds and, and finished half full. On the other side, it, it dried the soil out. And you want to dry the soil out because if you're running heavy machinery over wet soil, you're going to get compaction. Combines weigh a lot, of, you know, they're pretty heavy. And uh, trucks and grain carts, they're heavy. You want to dry that soil out. And uh, then you get two inches of rainfall at harvest time. On dry soil, it can take it. You can still get around on that soil. Whereas if your soil is wet and you get two inches of rainfall, you're going to be digging things out. You're going to be getting stuck. Not only compacting, but actually upsetting the, uh, the whole operation. So there's a lot in that, in just getting it right at the end. Not to mention, if you can save a turn, in this situation, it's 1.2 inches. It's money, but it's also saving on your allocation. You can carry that over, maybe, uh, and use it. And so it's water that you can turn into real dollars. In this situation, they were just taking it out of the soil. And another example here is uh, just down at Texoma, so not too far away. Uh, this farmer, a lot of water, 900 gallon wells on quarter mile sprinklers. He watered a lot. Shallow root system, because he, he basically had set up a shallow root system, and so he had to finish the way he started. Well, we had a discussion on this day here, and before that irrigation went on, and he'd shut down. He said, hey, did I make the right decision? I said, well, while well, your crop's finishing up, is it? And he said, oh, hell no. I'm sort of half starch line. I've got a, got a ways to go. And uh, why did you turn off? Probe says you're dry. He said, oh, my consultant's been out and probed every field, and I'm sitting, he can push the probe down like five feet, six feet. I've got tons of moisture. And I said, well, let's have a look at this. And so we looked at it, and uh, once again, you look at it and go, oh, wow, it's, it's lots of fuzz. Um, blow my brain here. But when you start to understand what it's telling you, you, can, you look at the stair steps, it's really these top five lines down to 20 inches that are doing all the work. Everything below there wasn't really doing any work. So he's really growing that crop on 20 inches of water, on uh, 20 inches of roots. And guess what? By the time he got to this point, that 20 inches are dry, he had roots deeper down, but they didn't even want to be in the game. The crop hasn't even gone looking. It's got lazy or something. So I said, think of it this way. You've got a tall glass, but you've got a short straw. And that short straw is now, it's, it's at its limit. So yeah, you've got water out there, but I don't think you're going to get be able to use that water to finish out that crop. He went, huh, okay, here's an experiment. I've got 22 circles. All the ones that are my lower yielding circles by five to 10 bushels, I'm gonna give them another drink. And guess what? They all out yielded the, the normally higher yielding fields by 10, five to 10 bushels. So he had a 10 to 20 bushel turnaround by that last irrigation. He'd already put a lot of water on there. He had to keep going. He had to finish the way he started. But boy, that made him a lot of money because corn was worth uh, you know, $6 plus and um, he was doing really well. So that last irrigation was a, uh, a good, good decision. So let's try and uh, wrap this up as far as uh, software. So let's sort of bring it all home. What do you get? So I've talked about the why irrigating is important. I've talked about how you have strategies. Now, like, what's on my user interface? What's in it for me? How do I, how do I make this uh, user friendly? Well, I talked about those colored icons. So when I log into the software, this is all online. It sends this uh, little box. It's got a modem in it. It sends data to the internet. So I log in on the internet, and the very first thing I see, if I want to, I can change the view, but the very first thing I would see is a map. And that map has got the locations of all my probes. And I can see, well, some are green, they're good. Well, this one's a bit too wet, I might check that one out. Well, I'm gonna go to this one first because it's dry and I might go out there and walk that field and just see how dry it is. This guy over here, he's getting, uh, getting ready for an irrigation. But I can immediately uh, get feedback just from those colors. 
I then click on an icon and what the software does, rather than me having to read all the squiggles on there, the software does it. So that's stair-stepping and which lines are stair-stepping down and which ones aren't. It blows my brain, I'm too busy. Uh, the software is going to show you in pictures. So this little root picture is going to grow down. So I start out and my roots are at 12 inches and they get to 16 and to 20 and so on. The, that root picture will grow and it will, will get deeper and deeper. And so data is coming in every hour and that picture is updating. And so when it starts to see that I've got uh, uh, roots to the next level, it will grow down to the next level. Then on this side here, I've got all my little depth indicators. And so they're actually going to color in based on the last irrigation or rainfall event. So how deep did water go down? Well, I don't have to worry about which sensors kicked up and which ones didn't kick up because this is going to actually, the, the software is going to pick that up and it's going to draw this in. So in this situation, the last irrigation went on there on uh, the 12th of September and it went down to 12 inches. So I can see big root system, shallow irrigation, you know, is that what I'm expecting or not? And so uh, it's sort of bringing it back to irrigating by pictures in a lot of ways. I can track on this side here. Um, I can actually add events so I can say when I fertilized, I can put in rainfall, I can do other things, keep a little diary. But uh, um, I can look at this picture uh, or I can go in on the software and I open up this graph. Uh, sorry if I go back one. If I click on that little picture there, it'll, it'll bring me to the graph. And so I get my, the, these tabs across the top and I can look at the summary graph and I can see uh, where am I in relation to my seasonal template. I can click on this, this census tab and I can look at all that uh, really detailed information if I want. I, I skipped over the EC because I showed you that before. I can look at temperature. Temperature is actually really, really neat. No one's ever collected temperature data before at, at all 12 sensor depths. And so, I, I mean, we don't know what we don't know, but I believe that we're going to start to see some correlations with root growth and temperature. Um, already you can see that just last year we had a cold snap in there and boy, did it cool the soil down. You'll see that when you irrigate, it cools the soil down, things like that. Uh, so you'll see these, these cycles and now we get to the end of the season here and we're s the pink line here goes up and down because the soil heats up and dries down, heats up and dries down. And you'll see before the canopy really closes in, we get a lot of diurnal and then as the canopy uh, really closes in, it's, it's less so. But then the soil starts to, uh, to cool down and so it flips over and now we're on a cooling trend. If you've got this probe out there set permanently in the ground 12 months of the year, you can actually start to see when the ground freezes and you can start to see you know, when it warms back up again and when I want to make uh, planting decisions and things like that. We get to see a view, we call this the field health report. So if I don't want to look at it on a map, I just want to look at it in a list. I can, I can basically get those same colored icons. I get the same information here as far as how deep my irrigation went and uh, how deep my roots went. We're actually going to, this um, forecasting tool, we're, uh, it's a very, very simple model. And so we're probably going to drop that. Um, but we were put it plotting a line to show you um, when you need to irrigate replace this with a fuel gauge, which I'll show you. We, we weren't going with the, the uh, really detailed sensor view because it's sort of too hard to read on your phone, not enough real estate. Or if I'm on a, um, a tablet or certainly on my computer, I'll go to the full website and then I get this map and stuff as well. But these three pictures are all available on your phone and they look just, just like that. And so really what we're trying to do is, is really put this data in front of you so you can make profitable decisions. You know how fast and how often to run your pivot. You know where your fertilizer is going. You want to improve your irrigation efficiency and, and increase your sustainability in terms of that process control. I told you about this uh, um, fuel gauge. So this will be new for 2015. And really what we're doing here is splitting it between the active root zone and, and the full root zone. So all sensors is like that template that I was showing you. And so that we're trying to follow what we're expecting to see as far as where we, where we sit between full and the expected empty. But up on the top side, it's actually, where am I today? I've got a 16 inch root system. So how full is that 16 inch root system? And, I'm, and if I've got a 20 inch root system, how full is it? How close to, to running out of moisture for the roots that I have am I? And by the time I get to the end of the season, 
this thing is going to be so dialed in as far as I know where my roots are and I know that I can run that tank dry. And uh, we're also, this little notch on here, that'll show you where you were 24 hours ago. We may put one in there that shows you where you were 20, 48 hours ago, but you can actually watch the, uh, the tank running down. So once again, even easier, more intuitive, trying to, uh, to um, make this very user, or usable so you can make decisions. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's timely decisions. So strategic irrigation management, it's about understanding the crop. Start with the crop and you can listen to the crop and you can visualize where the roots are and how it's using water. You can create the strategy on how I'm going to irrigate this crop and you learn from one year and you roll it forward to the next. And so over the course of uh, two or three seasons, you, you really have that process very finely tuned and uh, we, which comes down to process control, which is why We've found everywhere we've gone, people have adopted this and stuck with it and expanded across to, uh, to every management zone. But you're really trying to, uh, to get, you know, get your speed right, get your, um, your application right, and get your timing right. And it's all about the timing. So what does it cost? The um, uh, magic numbers. The, the equipment itself, one time cost, $700. So all the stuff that you need to collect this information, the probe, the telemetry, all of the, the gear, uh, $700. Then the, the um, we run on a subscription model. The, the normal price is $800 a year per site, but we're actually discounting that uh, for new business that we write this year, so there's a real incentive to get in. Uh, and not only is it cheaper in, the, in year one, but we're actually going to lock that in. So if you're in on a, on a cheaper price, you renew, keep that subscription current, then it's for $595 going forward. So you get in on a lower plane. And uh, then the um, co-op here are going to install for $200 a site. So if you sort of add that together, $600 and $200, we're up to eight and seven, so we're at $1,500 in year one, and $800 a year going forward after that, then that's your price point. For, um, so we're at about $6.40 going forward, a, um, uh, an acre uh, is the cost for irrigation management. And when you think about it, it's, uh, you know, it's really only a couple of bushels, which is very easy to, to get back, but it's also, can you save a turn or two on your, your pivot? Save some water, carry it over, uh, all of that. But the, um, the beautiful thing that we're offering here is uh, a satisfaction guarantee. Try it, and if you don't like it, if you're not satisfied with the data that you're getting, then we'll actually refund the money. And so uh, it's, we'll stand behind it. And so it's, um, you can't get better than that. The return on investment, I mean, really we're, we're talking about saving water, saving fertilizer, uh, real savings, but also uh, improving yield and quality and uh, giving yourself that ability to stay on track season after season. And our experience has been that the, um, that hardware cost you know, fifteen hundred dollars in year one. That's that's easy. I mean, that's a given a hundred percent payback. I mean, there's very few occasions, you know, where people are listening and watching and making decisions that they haven't fully paid for itself in the first year. I would expect it to um, to last. I normally, tell people that if you're trying to do some figures and amortize stuff out and, and look at the cost, do it over a three-year period because it's technology and it's actually going to go out of date before it wears out. But I'd expect it to work for five years. I do my sums over three years. Uh, it, we've got a lot of equipment that's been going for eight and nine years uh, out in the field. Uh, Telemetry's been superseded, but the um, probes have still been going strong. So, um, uh, questions? I've gone pretty quick through all of that. I'm not actually sure what the time is. But, uh, okay, so. <coughs> Stun silence. We're all excited to save water, make money. The, um, yeah. Growers can install it themselves if they want to. Yes, they can. So they can it's get. It's not hard to do. Uh, we went out this afternoon and, and put some probes in. And the. Um, it's, it's plug and play. So the, everything here is just simple connectors. 
and so there's no wiring. Uh, the only screwdriver you need is to put three screws in this bracket, and um, otherwise just do up some hose clamps. But everything else is in the in the kit. You will need an auger, and you will need a removal extraction tool to put it in, pull it out. Uh, but we, um, it's going to be less than a thousand dollars to get set up with the tools that you need uh, to get it done. And so depending on how many sites that you've got and how many years that you think you're going to need it, a lot of growers have opted to put it in themselves. Uh, it also gives the option of putting it in uh, after you plant. You basically take the telemetry down for harvest, but leave the probe in, put it back up, let it run through, strip till in the, um, uh, the spring, and you pull the probe out at that point, strip till, you'd wait until you plant, and then you come and put it back in again, and you try and get 10 months worth of data out of it. And um, a lot of people do that too. So, but you can, um, it's very easy, very plug and play. So when I plug the, uh, plug the probe into this, it, it makes a noise and tells me that it's found the probe. And then the next thing it'll do is go and look for the, uh, the cell tower. It actually connects to the tower and looks for our computer. And when it's found our computer, it, it sings at you and says, yes, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, so it's, it is grower installable, very much so. You leave one in a permanent one, 12 inches deep, and I'm saying it's between the row. Mm -hmm. um, is this still big enough the depth of the roots and all that is accurate when you set the regarding row? Um, good, good question. So we normally put the probe in the plant line, um, but in a permanent installation, what we'll do, it depends. If people plant straight, uh, it's really nice if they plant the same direction every year and they just offset, because then you can actually put it You'd stay, I'm going to go, if they offset 15 inches, I'm going to go seven and a half inches. So therefore, every year, I'm seven and a half inches off. It doesn't matter if I'm getting a very consistent result. If you change the direction, it gets much harder to, to know where you are in relation to the, the um, uh, plant line. So one year, you're going you know, northwest, southeast, or whatever. And then the next year, you, you change it by 30 degrees. Get gets harder for a permanent installation. But where we've been doing this a lot is where people plant on a circle and in inches and we can, as I said, be seven and a half inches off the row and it works very well. And um, yeah, so we're putting them usually about 10 inches of clear space. So the first sensor is 14 inches down. You use a vibrating plow and swap the, the cable 20, uh, at 20 inches deep out of the circle and put the telemetry outside. And so once it's in, it's in. Um, you do sacrifice that top foot of soil. So you sort of, we need to tweak and adjust the templates a little bit. But it's um, what a lot of guys will say, I can dig a hole a foot deep, but if I can't get my, if that dries out and I can't get my, my push probe through that wherever, I don't, I have no idea. I'm, I'm flying blind on <coughs> how dry it is underneath. It may be wet, it may not be, I don't know. So, and if I haven't wet that, that subsoil up, that fourth, fifth or third, fourth, fifth foot up coming into the, the um, season, uh, it's too late. I can't get the water on. So I need it before I planted the crop. There's a lot of guys down in Texas that'll put uh, six or eight out of 24 inches on even before the seed goes in the ground. So they're talking a quarter to a third of their you know, allocation goes on prior to planting. Okay, great question. What we do is we modify the environment in a uniform way. So we use a slurry. So um, we'll take topsoil and we'll put it through a sieve and break up the structure, get all the roots and rocks and other things out of it, and then uh, take that sieved soil and add water and make up a, a mud slurry, a bit like pancake batter, and then we'll pour that in the hole and then we'll wiggle the probe in so that it, it goes all the way around. And yeah, it's modifying the soil, but it's done in a very uniform way. And the thing that hurts you with these probes, and it's not just ours, it's any of capacitance probes, is air gaps. You don't want any air gaps around that probe. And so the slurry actually fills in all the gaps and it, it gives you a really good, really repeatable result. Um, and because we've put it through a sieve and we've broken up all the structure, there's no preferential flow down there. It's like wrapping it in blotting paper. Um, but where you get sandy soils, we can't, you can't do that. We don't want to have a, a slurry that's, that absorbs more water than the surrounding sand. So what we'll do, we still have that oversized hole, but we'll sieve some sand 
and then we'll pour it in as best we can around the outside and then use a fiberglass rod to pack it down. Once you've packed it, then we'll use a lot of water and try and move out away from the probe a little bit and try and, uh, you'll find when you use a lot of water in sand, the sand gets jelly-like and you can actually make the sand, uh, you're essentially making a slurry on the outside, but it, it tends to jiggle and pack itself in against the probe and once again, uh, with a small amount of training, you can get a really good result very quickly. If that we're answers your question. Okay. We're, yeah. we're a skilled slide runner and we've got to be able to look at placing probes as far as we're at in the field. Sure. Um, Actually, do you want to turn the lights? Um, so, yeah. Um, the probe is really measuring the plants just around the, around the probe. And so if you've got 120, 130 acres out there or you've got, um, you know, you're, you're using a small area to, as a representative sample for a very large area. And <coughs> so you've got to pick that area correctly. And uh, so the results are only going to be as good as the, the place you select. And so people say, how many probes do I need? You need one per management unit. So if you're growing one crop under that pivot, I'd start with one probe under that pivot. Where you put it is really important because if you've got uh, if you've got all one soil type, then that's great. You've got some other things that you can think about in terms of, well, the southwest corner might get all the hot wind. So if I put it in that corner, then that's going to dry out first. And so if I can keep that wet, everything else would be good. So uh, it may be that I always <coughs> park my pivot on the pivot road, which happens to be a certain place. And so if it rains, I'm going to shut down. It's going to be there. So when I start again, uh, I want to basically have that in the first day of when I walk over it. So, you know, I've made my decision on when I start and it just follows on from there. Uh, if you've got multiple soil types out there, then you're going to say, well, I want to go in the majority soil type. So if 20% is one and 80% is another, I'm going to go in that 80%. Uh, if it's 50-50, if it's you might say, well, I look after my lighter soil because if I can do that, then the heavier soil is going to be fine. It, you know, it really depends on the crop. But we've got a, a checklist of, of um, you know, what to think about and sort of the order of, of importance to, you know, when it comes to site selection. And of course, we, we never go in the outside span because you get too many edge effects, um, especially, you know, if, it's, um, if you've got dry corners and things like that, you'll get, you know, real edge effects. So we'll usually go in the second to the outside span on a quarter mile. We may go third to the outside span on a half mile pivot, just get a little bit further in. But we want to stay, you've got to remember that with a pivot, the outside quarter, like the outside, if you've got eight spans, the outside two spans are half the area, just because of they walk a greater radius and that's the way it works out. And so you want to be in the, the, the bigger area of the circle. Um, so we'll generally go with the second span in. Does that answer all, yeah. Um, we'll usually pick a spot under a nozzle um, simply because the roots will go where the water goes and so you know we have nozzles are, are um, five feet apart quite often and you know you're dragging nozzles through the canopy well, we've got a better chance of, of being under the water and not having anything shaded if we're under a nozzle and um, so that's a, another rule of thumb so yeah Uh, absolutely. So you go as slow as you can without water running off. I mean, that's obvious in terms of, um, you know, so if I said, hey, you need to go on a six-day loop, there are, um, there are guys, they go to Nebraska and they'll laugh at you and they say, if I go, I got to, if I put any more on than three quarters of an inch, it's going to run because I've got, I've got hills. And so there's a physical limit there. You get other people, even on flat ground, that say, man, if I try and go any more than, you know, an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, it just puddles. Why? Because they've got infiltration issues and that's a whole separate deal about tillage and, and strip till versus conventional till and all that. Um, so you can't put any more water on than the soil can take. And, but I would go as slow as I can for the soil still to take it. 
and if there's anything I can do to improve my infiltration rate, then I'll, I'll do that too. And so holding trash, not cultivating, like strip tilling or no tilling is always going to give you better infiltration um, than conventional cultivation. So there's, but I take your point, I totally agree. It, you do not want water running off the field. So, you know, if that's a problem, then we need to think about how do you address it. So, um, but the experience, certainly in this part of the world where it's hot and it's dry um, and it's windy, that slow, slower is better. And the reason for that is because, I, quite simply, if I, if I poured water on this table and I just had a little puddle there, it might take, I don't know, six hours to dry. But if I smeared it out across the table, it might dry in an hour. I mean, you're basically, that surface area is so much greater that it's going to evaporate so much quicker. Now, if I'm running at twice the speed, I've got twice as much wet ground. And so if it takes me two hours to dry the soil out, in that two hours I've got twice as much wet soil, I'm losing twice as much water. Plus, if I'm going really fast, I'm wetting all the plants. And wetting the plants, if I'm only putting a small amount of water on those plants, chances are it doesn't have time to run off and it's going to evaporate straight away. So all the water that hits the plants, I'm going to lose. I'm going half the speed. The water that hits the plants has got a better chance of running down because there's twice as much of it and going into the soil. I've got half as much wet soil. And I'm, that water has a chance to run through and get deeper and get away from, because the top four inches is still going to um, uh, evaporate. Water will, will you get some capillary rise and it will evaporate off that surface. Yes, once the canopy gets up, it'll, it'll help you, but you're still gonna get, get losses. Think about this, if I'm going half the speed, I've got half as many passes in that field. So half as many passes means half as much traffic, which means half as deep wheel tracks. And so we've got guys now who are running bubble mode, flat ground, heavy soils in Texas, who are putting on a 2.2 inch pass and they, at the end of the season, their wheel tracks are about, about that deep. <laughs> because they're doing, on bubble mode, they're actually keeping water away from the wheel tracks, keeping the wheel tracks dry, and they're just not putting the traffic out there. And so when your wheel tracks are really shallow, they're trying to keep them dry, not wet. And it's a complete reverse psychology. So if it rains, they can shut down, they, can, they get a lot more control. And, um, uh, they're always trying to walk over, over dry ground. And so, can everyone do it? No. But it's taken them a little while to get there. But once you, if you've got half as much traffic, then you're not going to, and you don't get as deep a wheel tracks, you're not going to get stuck as much, you're not going to get flat tires. Um, so, plus, it improves your efficiency just from that evaporation story. Can you do it around here? Um, maybe. Uh, certainly, further south, they've, it's taken a little while to catch on, but boy, 2011 was a wake-up call. And a lot of guys just, who, everyone that had probes went, wow, my water is just not infiltrating, I need to slow down. They did it inside the season because they got immediate feedback and they learnt just right then that uh, um, exactly, it, everyone that puts probes in learns so much about their irrigation system. Some things confirmed what they already knew, other things that, that taught them, wow, that's, that's interesting. And, and that's another point too. When you try probes, when you, one is a lonely number because it'll probably show you something that you're not expecting. And you look at it and you go, probe's wrong. It can't be. It's, uh, my roots go deeper than that or, or water infiltrates deeper than that. You, you put two probes out there and they tell you the same thing, you're more likely to go, hmm, I think, I think there's something in that. And uh, so you'll learn more quickly. Uh, plus, you'll get differences. Something will happen, it'll rain there, it doesn't rain there, you get a breakdown, the pivot gets stuck, something will be different in the way that you irrigate and you'll go, ah, I just learned something too, that it's with these changes. And so I'd always encourage you if you're starting out to, to try a couple just because you'll learn more quickly. So, um, Yeah, so we, we would normally, um, because we don't want to come back, we'd, we'd put it up, it's about nine feet, uh, we'd put it up nine feet. Now, if, if that's a hassle and you want to spray, I mean, you can either, um, there is a T-post there that we, we 
put in the ground. So unless you want to take the T-post out, you've got something that's fixed. We can undo the, uh, the hose clamp and telescope the whole thing down and get it down to sort of five and a half feet, which is much, uh, it's, it's helpful for spraying. So, you know, you can put it down before you go out there and then come back, you know, a couple of days later and put it back up again. But um, we had been offering a service in, in uh, basically the reason we hadn't got to, to this part of the world before is because we had a couple of guys in, on the I-80 corridor in Nebraska and a couple of guys in the Texas Panhandle as sales guys and we've been so busy in those areas we just hadn't quite got down in between you know where, where you are. We've sort of been slowly making our way up from the south and slowly making our way down from the north and hadn't quite met up here so we're pretty excited to be here but we were close to home because we were offering a service and with that service we generally just set it up so we didn't have to come back to it. And farmers, you know, would work around it. Um, the only time we really had trouble with things getting hit by spray rigs is when you've, you've got a contractor out there. <laughs> Oops, I forgot to tell you, you know, the farmers would very rarely hit it themselves, but, you know, if they get somebody else out there, especially at night. But uh, the beautiful thing is this is all plug and play, so we can swap these around and put another one on there and get it back working again very quickly. Uh, things are all monitored so we know what's what's not working and we can get out there and offer a very high level of service. And obviously, um, Garden City Co-op have got access to all of that. It's really easy to move up and down though. It's just initially some of the hose clamp and it comes down and it's funny when you see people move up and you see someone are off this side off the ground. Or if you're going to spray it, like rain coming in, it would literally take you less than five minutes to drop one down, spray it, and then push it back up. Um, if people are, I mean, quite often, if people know that they're going to come in and, and side dress or cultivate, we'll just wait until after they've done that because it's usually pretty early. I mean, you've got to do it early or else the crop's going to, you're going to be damaging the crop. So you just come and install after that's been done. Uh, that's usually what happens. So people will say, just wait, let me get my, um, yeah, my side dress on, I'll come through and, and cultivate, and that's the standard, standard deal there. If the probe was in the row, though, I guess you could take your chances. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you are, well, I mean, unless you're plowing out your, your crop, yeah. I mean, in Australia... Well, you can take off the... Oh, but it's still, it won't read the same again. Because you, you know, you did your slurry deal, but you run your cultivator, even if it's right in the middle of the row, you run your cultivator through, this is now looser than... You probably, you might see a, a step change in the data, but um, that's real. It's happened for the rest of the field, so, you know, I mean, it's... It that so, yeah. We're all excited, going to go out and buy some probes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could win one. Maybe you could do, do it that way. So... So if anyone's got any questions, I'm going to have to sort of, I guess everyone's going to want to get going, but uh, I'm happy to sort of, through Brian or any one of the other guys, get a hold of me and um, answer those questions. So. Do you have a template for alfalfa? Yes, we do. Alfalfa, well, alfalfa is, it's really boring template because it's pretty much straight across. I mean, you, you've got your, your root system set. Uh, you, you, it works beautifully for alfalfa because we can get that either at ground level or slightly below or we can actually bury it. I mean, with alfalfa, you're not running, running steel through it. I mean, you, 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 you're not cultivating alfalfa. So you put it in there at ground level and put the cable down and, and take it away, get the telemetry either over on, you know, somewhere where you can go around it or just get it to the side of the field. And you can mow, rake, bale, do everything and not touch it. You don't have to take it out. I mean, it's in there. You've got a stand that goes three, four, five years. It's in there and it's it, great payback. But alfalfa, it's a thirsty crop. Uh, you're using a lot of water and you, um, you really can see. The trick with alfalfa is trying to keep it growing when you're cutting it. And you'll find that there are tricks. You know, like you'll, you'll start to see because you can... 
get that heartbeat, you know, you can you can see how much you shock it when you when you give it a haircut, <laughs> and it also how you can try and keep it keep it going. If you're trying to build up your soil moisture, give it something to so that when you you've got hay on the ground, you don't want to run your pivot. So you've got to build it up, but not so much that you're going to get compaction. So it's it's one of those things. It can be sort of tricky to have really high production alfalfa, but you can do it, and it's a good tool for that. So. Yeah, we worked in a lot of different crops. Alfalfa is a great one because it is a permanent planting and uh, you can get things set up and, and running really well. Uh, yeah, we, we've got some probes in some Kentucky bluegrass and I'm trying to think. Uh, there's a guy um, just down uh, south of Pampa um, that's got some probes in, in grass. I think, I don't know if he's cutting hay or seed, I think it's hay. Um, making uh, a guy called Rex McKay. He's got a few circles down um, south of Pampa, like so if you know where that is in the Texas Panhandle, east of Amarillo. Uh, that's one I know of. Uh, yeah, that's starting to up in Oregon and places, they grow a lot of grass seed up there. We're starting to put some probes in up there, we will certainly for next summer. What kind of grasses are you growing? Okay. This is for grazing or? Mm -hmm. One thing I will say for grazing, cattle love to come and push up against these things. Like you've got the, the pole out and the, so I would encourage you to run a long cable, like have, have the probe underground. And how long do you, is it, brome grass is perennial or annual? Okay, so you're running it for hopefully multiple seasons. And um, so you can get set up and put the telemetry on the outside. Yeah. Or fence it off, or um, you know, put you know they're going to scratch on it, so you put a big four or six foot wooden fence post in there. So strap it to that. We used to do a lot of dairy pasture in Australia, and um, dairy cattle won't push up on it; they're used to staying away. But uh, So. <coughs> yeah. Well, thanks for uh, coming along.